Hi, I'm Michelle. This is my so-called handmade life. I have a blog by the same name and I'm my so-called handmade life on Instagram too. There's a Ravelry group for the My So-Called Handmade Life podcast and I'm Mamatronic on Ravelry and I'm active on Ravelry. So anything I talk about in this today, you'll find links to it in the description box on YouTube and please comment here. Um, also, if you're on Ravelry and you're a knitter or a crocheter, you really need to be on Ravelry. In our podcast group, there's a thread for the episode. Anything I talk about there, any of our conversation there in that thread or here on YouTube or on the blog post with the embedded video will all be up for grabs. I'll probably talk about it in the next episode. Um, and you kind of shape where the conversation goes. So I really love it when you talk back to me because I'm a homebody still and it's just me, dogs and cats much of the day. So make me happy. Talk to me. <clears throat> That sounded pitiful, but oh well. I hope you all had a good spring break. I did. Uh, does spring break even matter to you if you don't have kids in school? Um, my youngest is in college, but he had time off and he was over quite a bit. We got to see him a little more than normal and that was fun. He even asked me to lunch one day and that was, that was nice for me. Uh, and he was making conversation. He wasn't looking at his phone and things like that you might expect. It was really nice. So anytime I make something that I think he'll like, I'll let him know we're having it. But I swear, every time he wants to come over for supper, it's kind of last minute. And we're always having something he hates, like fish or taco soup, you know. So last night he's like, what's for supper? And I said, fish taco soup. <laughs> and he's like, what? I heard it was spaghetti. <laughs> like, yeah, it's spaghetti. So he came over and we saw him again. We sound like old folks. We love it when you come to see us, boy. My whole goal for from spring all through summer is to completely de-stress. And I talked to you about it some last week on a very deep level. And not just to do the obvious stressors, you know, to avoid those, but like deep down stuff that I just couldn't quite face and deal with in the fall, I need to go ahead and face about uh, just things that have happened. There's been some losses, right? I feel like this whole, all of 2018, the theme was loss. <laughs> um, and you guys probably feel that way too. You're like, man, every time I tune into her, something sad's happened. Um, that's not true. Only a couple of sad things happened in 2018. They were really sad, but uh, I was dealing with health issues from things in the past. So anyway, I was making great strides. I like only had migraines still as part of the hormonal imbalance. And I have extra weight on me, but it's not like a bad amount or anything. But those migraines are getting so bad. I told you guys, I want to, I'd like to try one more thing to try and balance them, the hormones, and then but I'm just gonna give up and say, this is the way it's gonna be till menopause. So it's the only option after this de-stressing thing. When I get stressed out, I do put on weight. And since my dad died, that's just, it's just been true that that's happened. Um, and that can release more estrogen. It, it interferes with that type of hormone imbalance pretty bad from all that I've read. And so, you know, I can try to lose weight. I eat really healthfully. I don't think I need to eat less food. Um, I might even need to eat more food. So I'm not quite sure what to do. Um, Things stack against you as you age with that kind of imbalance. So uh, Shauna had mentioned intermittent fasting, which has worked for her. She has healed her body uh, so much inside through changing the way she ate, practicing intermittent fasting, and she's also do, done some workouts, added some strength training that maybe she didn't do before or a different type and high intensity intervals. So. High intensity intervals, strength training, all things that I did regularly all through the years, except in the very busiest times of taking care of my grandparents. Uh, but, um, so I'm not quite sure, other than the intermittent fasting, that she said she really thinks would help me. And my husband has been saying that for a while. I'm telling you, you need to try intermittent fasting. Um, but like he, is more like an intermittent eater 
like he fasts all the time. He eats like one meal a day. I consider that intermittent eating. Um, and it feels harsh for the way I'm living right now because he has no food issues. He eats whatever he wants when he eats and he like pigs out for his meal of the day. Sorry, Adam. Um, I just like eat like fruits and vegetables, mostly vegetables, uh, healthy wild caught fish and all this stuff. Um, very little sugar. So I've, like, I've got all these restrictions on me. Wheat and gluten and dairy and I just don't want to do any more deprivation. But she mentioned a book called um, Delay Don't Deny or Delay Not D Deny and she said there's an intermittent fasting podcast that would be helpful for me. And I like having a source to study. Um, the podcast I can like listen to today when I go for my walk. I really appreciate Shauna you sharing that because um, you know he has been after me to try it and I just felt like oh I all I want to do is finally be good to myself because that's something I just not I haven't done much of in my life like taking care of me and uh, things have slowed down and there's no reason not to but uh Delay, not deny, the whole point of that, I'm sure, is that it's not deprivation, it's just kind of smart strategies. Um, I've seen some other things about kind of hacking your uh, hormonal makeup and, um, I don't know, fixing, correcting imbalance, so I'll see. I've just heard a lot of things about fasting. It doesn't always work with women the way it does for men. And several places online, they had testimonials of women who's hormone imbalances got way worse after doing it but I mean who I didn't do deep research about it so it's an option that I can try to further balance the the hormonal thing besides I felt concerned when my husband started doing it because he ate so little even though he like gorged when he ate that didn't seem right to me but his doctor like he had a, like a heart scare a few months ago it has been a stressful year, okay? He had a mini stroke, basically, because his blood is too thick, which is so weird. He has to drink more water, that's all. Um, but they tested all of his numbers, and they were like, everything's good. And he, he has a yearly checkup, and they were like, everything's better. And I'm like, what about all this fasting he's doing? And the doctor said, no, that's actually helping him. That's really good. So, shows what I know. But Shauna's a woman. And though she's younger than me, I'm pretty sure, much younger than me, she uh, does have a similar hormonal makeup, and and it's really encouraging the changes you can see on her Instagram, the or on her uh, podcast, Shauna Stitches. Um, she's like had renewed vitality. Um, there's been weight loss, but there's been strength gain and stuff like that. And the strength gain, that's kind of a big deal for me. I um. I've never been into worrying about like my weight, being thin, um, looking like some sort of picture perfect female, uh, but I like the idea of strength, more strength again. So uh, it's like other people, girls I knew were admiring um, supermodels, because remember uh, Cindy Crawford and all was a big deal in the 80s. Supermodels, Elle McPherson, and I was like thinking Linda Hamilton and Terminator 2, you know, it shows her like doing pull-ups and her muscles. Of course, I look back now and she looks very emaciated. <laughs> she does not look strong in Terminator 2, but I mean, we didn't know because all we ever saw was emaciated models, you know. Um, I thought, you know, she's, she's strong, that's cool, but anyway, um, so. The health thing, kind of a big deal. And a lot of you enjoyed that quote from Chris Cresser about how it's better to eat the wrong things with the right attitude. I so applied that after The Wizard of Oz and we went to eat and I got a piece of chocolate cake. It was so freaking good. <laughs> it was the wrong thing for a hormone imbalance, but it was so right as it went down. Thank you, Shauna, for the comments. Um, so let me show you where I am on my Kia socks. I'm not much further along. We went and saw The Wizard of Oz. Um, oh, it's not in this one. We went and saw The Wizard of Oz uh, 
yesterday at the, I'm um, not yesterday, last week at the classic movie. And, uh, I worked on my Kia socks. This is the Mockingbird Fiber Company. They're uh, Monica's Apartment colorway. You can see it's great uh, purple with little flecks of blue and yellow and then the great contrasting color. Um, yeah, I shouldn't have worked on this in the theater because I kept forgetting what row I was on and it makes little equal signs. And this is one of those things because of our conversation in the knitting community on racism much like the broader conversation in all communities. Um, I messed it up totally, <laughs> so I had to rip back a bunch, and then I finally got to where I was, so there's really no progress there to show. Um, I also have still need to do this heel in my gingerbread socks. This is old Jinx yarn. It's not old, but, you know, she's not dying anymore, so ye old Jinx yarn. Um, I am afraid to bring this to a movie because if I keep knitting and knitting, I'm going to knit past the toe and then have to undo it, and it's wasted work. So tonight, the classic show is showing Teen Wolf, and I'm going to go, and I'm just going to bring Floozy, and I'm going to work on it because it's, it's yellow, it's kind of bright, it should show up in the theater, and I just need to put in like an inch at a time on it. Um, it is a little difficult for my hands to knit. It's luxury yarn. It's got cashmere and silk in it. It slips across the needles. And something about my loose knitting, I just, uh, yeah, it, I have to constantly tighten up. I have to often go back and re-knit sections because they're loose stitches. They just want to slide off that needle. So, uh, if that, a movie would be a good time to do that because it's just straight stockinette and it's a bright enough color I think I could see it in the theater so um, I don't think I have it oh yeah but see I have no progress to show you guys and I feel really bad because I mean I don't want you to think I don't love this I love this I love N Libby's patterns you know that because I stopped working on this to test knit another one of her patterns and she just keeps coming out with good stuff. She came out with, um, uh, is it Tui? It's a, uh, a sweatshirt looking sweater. It's very comfy and I have the perfect yarn for it. It's got a soft denim-y, it looks denim colored. It's got a soft feel to it. Again, with some silk in it, but um, yeah, I can't wait to cast that on. I'm not sure when I'm going to do that, but um, uh, I'm going to do Floozy tonight at, and watch Teen Wolf. I mean, I'm excited. Our classic theater is finally getting uh, some new movies. They just did the same movies for forever. The Blues Brothers, which I still haven't seen. Um, the Godfather 1 and 2. I think I've saw, seen them three times there. Every year they show it, usually in the summer. And, I mean... I'm over The Godfather. I love Pacino. I love Diane Keaton, but... And they never show the third one. I, I don't understand why. I'm kidding. I understand why. That movie was horrible. <laughs> I, had, uh, I mean, I know Sofia Coppola. I guess she's a big deal as a director and producer now, but her iconic screen debut was just awful. <laughs> no, Dad... No, Dad. Yeah, there was that scene. That was just awful. So, uh, yeah, so they have uh, Teen Wolf, um, The Wizard of Oz. I've never seen that one before at that theater. And I'm trying now, I've gone blank on all the movies that they're going to have. But it's all fun ones. Um, so, that's what I'm going to work on. So, we've had a, uh, well, let me just go guys okay I might have to cut this and put it at the very beginning a week a episode or two ago I showed you a bunch of clips from my trip to Detroit with my husband he works for Ford and it was he was getting like an award and we saw the Henry Ford Museum the Ford home the Rouge factory and I told you about this big civil war uh, civil war <laughs> civil rights display and at the museum and how it was a huge focus of the tour even though we were doing a rushed you know compressed tour they made sure we spent the most time there and i don't know if i cut it out 
I, I know I said it at some point that I, I didn't know he had anything. He was big on civil rights. He did save a lot of documents, but he was anti-union. And so usually civil rights, anti-union, it doesn't usually go hand in hand, you know, in history. So, uh, yeah, he was not civil, into civil rights at all. <laughs> Two of you messaged me that he was a big time anti-Semite and had written a book about it. Since then, my husband's looked some stuff up and found some papers of something Zion, uh, something he wrote about it. And he has a really ugly blight on his legacy because of it. So I just didn't know. Yeah, so I'm sure the reason so much emphasis was put on civil rights was they want to uh, change his reputation or the reputation of the company. A kind of, um, which I understand. Uh, he was really innovative. He, he was great at what he did as far as, um, you know, assembly line manufacturing, uh, fast manufacturing of vehicles that were affordable for everyone. But he did have this ugly way of thinking and apparently was friends with Hitler. I mean, it's pretty bad. So, uh, yeah, he was not a big civil rights hero. Anyway, uh, I need to add an edit to my notes on that episode. Uh, thank you, Frau K, and uh, I think it was Mariana. Thank you for letting me know about that, because near Detroit there is a um, Holocaust Museum, and Mariana lives near Detroit, and she didn't know about Henry Ford, but they had this big thing on him at the Holocaust Museum. So, I mean, here's this plant right next to the Holocaust Museum, and like, ugh, I can see why they have a big civil rights display. The display was still good, you know, but, um, man. Okay. Uh, so I'm trying to think of some other things you guys told me about. Hmm. Some more hacks. Uh, Carmen never did say a, a couple episodes ago, what DIY kind of hacks she has done. She actually made knitting needles, not out of plungers, but out of chopsticks, and used them, especially when she was first knitting, just to avoid costs, you know, trying out this uh, hobby, which is a really great idea. That's smart. Dawn has had a friend make a plastic, a purse out of plastic bag yarn for her, a bag, and she said that some people she knows of they make blankets knit out of plastic bag yarn for homeless people because it's waterproof, which is a neat idea. I never thought about that. I've never heard of that. So I was wondering, Dawn, if uh, your friend used a pattern for this plastic bag bag, or if she just kind of made something up or followed a regular pattern just using that kind of yarn. I would be interested to know. Um, Sarah Jane also liked all that... Um, information about the dodak that twenty dollars or less um, spinning wheel you can make yourself um, she was headed to a spinning retreat she was going to learn from someone on Texel Island I think is the name of the island and they have this Texelar sheet there um, well she did she loved knitting um, spinning in fact I love the phrase she used for it it felt like the core of craft to her and she just dove in and bought a secondhand spinning wheel. So it's not a dodec. It's just something already ready to go. And uh, on her Instagram, Atelier Sarah Jane, you can see her uh, her first spinning, her first yarn that she spun. And it's like a bulky kind of thick and thin, which most people I hear do uh, spin bulky until they get the hang of uh, making finer yarns or having an even. Um, kind of a draft to it. I don't know the word. So uh, I told her I'm, I'm interested in spinning because lately I've been looking at retro or older patterns, like those knit one pattern books that I forced my husband to look at with me. Um, and there's a lot of funky yarn, like boucle and um, kind of crazy colors, um, mohair or thick and thin. And I wanted some thick and thin yarn. It's, it's really hard to find affordable because it's usually bulky. 
or super bulky actually and just to find bulky or ran is very hard and it's it's not a, it's not inexpensive usually so I was saying man if I could spin I could do that I would save so much money and somebody on Instagram I'm thinking it was Tracy just said spinners everywhere are laughing <laughs> because it can be a very expensive hobby. It kind of depends on what you choose to do, how you source your stuff, but I know the wheels can be expensive. Let's talk about the Wing It Cow. I put off doing this episode because I wanted to have my sweater ready to go to wear for you guys, but it is still drying and has a million ends to weave in. So, and I'm a little nervous that the vertical stripes have messed up the drape. I know they're not too tight, but just something about them, um, it hung weird on me. However, it's blocking. This is the kind of sweater you have to block twice. Uh, so we'll see. Hopefully all is well. I haven't tried it on. It's just still too wet to even try, but um, I'm afraid of messing it up. Uh, I just don't want the rib to flare, the ribbing to flare out, which it did before I blocked it the first time. So we have a lot of finished works in progress. And let me just go ahead and say the winner, I drew the winner of the giveaway. And you, all you had to do is have an FO, a finished object in our FO thread on the Ravelry group. And I can't even remember how many there were. One has been added since because you can keep adding. Um, the drawing is over, but uh, the giveaway, but you can keep adding your finished stuff because I haven't put mine in. I actually knit Strathcona and I have um, my Wing It Cow uh, major sweater that I was planning. So um, 18 projects. 18 projects. The first post I think was for me. Um, and I'm going to show you images of them now. So Carmen finally finished her Gramps Revive sweater and this was yarn she dyed herself. It's a really great retro looking cardigan. I like the colors she chose. I like everything about it. Um, and she did get it finished in time for the knit along. She did that and she did a cowl for her daughter in bright speckled yarn. I think it was like birthday cake was the name of the, uh, the yarn. We have Jen who did her uh, a shawl with some special yarn. It was special to her and she wanted something simple where the yarn kind of got the spotlight and she just designed a, a simple uh, shawl with eyelets. Adina did uh, socks that she just kind of winged it one day when she had no other project to bring to sub for school and she called them her sub socks and she did two pairs of them. Then she did a uh, color work sweater in yarns that for her she was trying to use stash so she was kind of winging it with her color combinations she thought it was a little wild and contrasty but it's actually as you can see very retro very cool looking it makes me think of a retro ski jacket or ski sweater <clears throat> Frau K took an old sweater that she had knit already Birkin and she it didn't fit her good in the shoulders so she wanted to make it into a cardigan and so she steaked for the first time and she added ribbing and then a uh, I-cord bind off to finish it off. It looks so nice. And she said it's so enjoyable to wear now. Claudia knit a dachshund hat and she changed it so that one dachshund would look like a long hair and the other a regular dachshund because she has both. And she enjoyed it so much she knit a second hat, but one of them, the crown decreases, she didn't like the way it looked. So she pulled them out, made it into a cowl, and then knit another hat. So she actually knit three projects, though she only put in one post in this thread. <clears throat> Kat knit her sweater. It's a cool, to me, retro looking uh, sweater with a vertical slip stitch look to it. Jerry is the name of it. And it looks really good in a very variegated yarn. Her sample was very, very much variegated. It looks cute. Her buttons look cute. And this is the kind of sweater I could see mix and match buttons looking nice with. Katinka did socks. And it was just kind of a last minute thing. She wanted to participate, but she's had a lot going on, but she had some travel time. And so she actually whipped out a pair of socks 
with cabling and she just totally invented the pattern and they're great they're great and they're kind of short cuff socks they look shorter kind of like the way I like to make my socks like to wear with high tops or something they're not a really long leg sock they're really cute um, with some self striping yarn it looks like uh, unless she just striped yarn I'm thinking it's self striping anyway really smart you guys with your own sock patterns Ada did a sock pattern of her own design and it had a slip stitch to it and it looks like it's got reverse stockinette uh, facing out but she just kind of mixed and matched yarns and they don't totally match the toe of each sock so it's really cute the cuff doesn't either she also knit a sweater using what she had on hand. She's trying to use stash. So there's bobbles, there's a keyhole, there's garter, and there's a little lace at the edge. It's just really nice. She also knit a, uh, a shawl, and it's one of those shawls that looks kind of like it wraps better around your body. It's not a crescent or, or a triangle. It's got like uh, three sides, almost like three sides of a box, a square. Look, I don't know the shape. The name of that shape but it's really nice she also did she did quite a bit um, she started with a drops pattern but her gauge and her size wasn't right so she changed it she took off the button bands she made decreases so she crocheted the bands she's still having issues with that one I think she said uh, it curls again after blocking heavily modified sweater pattern Sarah Jane did cartography and she made it cropped and she also just did it in two colors instead of I think you can do four colors for that sweater she also did socks that she dyed uh, the yarn for Nick changed it up a plain sweater pattern by adding striping and using stash yarn it's really cute it came out great the other Ada did a vest a color work vest it's really great high contrast vest really nice and she did the whole thing steaking so she steaked the v-neck she steaked the sleeves it's just fabulous oh, you're seeing it on the screen right now <clears throat> oh I forgot that Adina also knit a shawl and this was fun she did it with some yarn that had been her mother's and it's some of one of the original hand dyers that was out there she just made up this shawl uh, with the mohair garter border kind of ruffles at the edge and it's really beautiful. Sarah Jane also did a cowl. That's after the deadline for the knit along, but it's just a simple cowl with a bit of a bandana shape. She said it's a good template for practicing new stitches or techniques. Trees is the name of the pattern, so I'll have a link for that. <clears throat> yes, Vicky was the one you saw um, the last episode at least I showed you she added a wider button band and made it a little longer and she loves the outcome and it looks good it looks like it was made to be that way you can't tell that she modified it and it has a nice easier fit on her you saw my Strathcona but my uh, plaid sweater it's plaidster it's uh, not finished um, I've got to weave in a million ends so I drew for the winner, and the winner was getting, I think it was this one, Beginner's, Design to, <laughs> Beginner's Guide to Writing Knitting Patterns, which I know not everybody might be into. I like the idea of it. And Weekend Knitting, um, which I found at uh, a resale shop. I have my own copy of this. I love this. This is my first knitting book to love and I'm telling you there is not one pattern in here I still would not want to make today not one so that and then some yarn that I have for it probably will make this is some Madeline Tosh yarn it will probably make a uh, a mini stripe a micro stripe I'm about to run out of battery Claudia you're the winner <laughs> Claudia of the Dachshund hat so and cowl so Claudia you are our winner um, and I will have contacted you about these prizes and uh, I get it if you're not super excited about this book but I, I had two of them and I thought well that's kind of neat since we're doing the wing it cowl and it's about designing your own pattern 
possibly more about the pattern writing. And then this is just a great classic pattern book that I'm sentimental about. So, And probably micro striping yarn. This is a one of a kind colorway from Madeline Tosh. So thank you all for participating. And I don't think I would have finished the sweater that I made without your encouragement. So I love you guys for that. I also certainly wouldn't be writing it as a pattern, but I think I'm going to do that. If you participated in this knit along, whether you finished by the 15th or not, if you had something in the works in progress thread, you will get a copy free of my pattern when it comes out. Whatever it is, whether it's hideous or not, you're getting a free pattern and that'll happen when I get it written up, which might take a while. I thought the idea of writing up how you did something, it requires you to think a little more about ease and uh, how you talk about what you're doing. I liked that. I found that interesting and I liked to do that. I liked designing my own sweater. It's a simple, simple shape, but it was not a simple pattern to write up. Um, my notes were fun to write. They were also insanely messy and it took me an entire day to decipher them when I was done with the sweater. And I found several things I could do better or differently. So um, I don't know that anyone is going to want to knit this, uh, but I love the idea of learning to write up a pattern. I feel like somehow having the skill of grading a knitted object and writing up a pattern is just a good thing for me to have. I just feel like it would be a good thing to have. I don't know where that would go. So uh, in thinking about originality patterns, there are so many people coming out with new things. Why would I think I could add anything to it? Why would I want to do this when I'll probably end up just be borrowing something that's already been done? Um, it got me thinking about when is inspiration flattering and when does it cross the line to creative theft? And I was going to ask you guys some thoughts about it. Uh, but then, you know, I talked about that DIY, uh, DIY zine mixtape ethos. Let me check my time here. I went looking for knitting zines and I had forgotten that Mimi of the Yarn Chicks podcast does have her own zine and it's so sweet. I ordered the two that she still has in stock in her Etsy shop and it's so neat. It's handmade, hand typed, photos glued in. There's um, poems, articles, thoughts, a pattern that folds out, um, an uh, interview with a designer a recipe, lots of art. It's really good. Um, I enjoyed it. And she has this little article in here that she calls Super Citational. And uh, she's talking about this hierarchical structure in the designing world or the knitting world where, you know, picturing like a, a triangle, you know, you've got your average person on the street knitter and it kind of trickles and filters up to the top of the uh, the class, the, the upper echelon of um, knitwear designers or knitters. Um, and she just, I, I kind of made a, a note of some of the things she said that let me get to it. That say as, as people when they reach a certain amount of success get a certain number of Instagram followers that suddenly they're not talking to the little guy the people who don't have a lot of followers they're part of this upper group now and even though often we're influenced by people who are not part of that group um, they don't mingle and even borrow influences and not give anyone creative credit because you know one, I don't know exactly what's on Mimi's mind as she writes this. I can think of a few instances where some yarn companies have taken 
uh, independent designers' ideas and mimicked it almost exactly. And they've been called out on it. And, uh, but I've seen where it's possible uh, people do that to one another, um, but you see it in life, even not in the knitting world, where people borrow. They borrow ideas, they borrow philosophies, jokes, um, personality traits, and there's something about, it's kind of Mr. Ripley about it. Do you remember the talented Mr. Ripley? Um, this guy's obsessed with this guy, um, it basically takes over his life, and, uh, kills him and takes his place. <laughs> it's an extreme example, but there's some on some level she's discussing that we do this with creative ideas. We borrow from others and don't credit them and we act as though we are the alpha and the mega, the beginning and end of all ideas. And uh, I just I've not noticed this as much in the knitting world as just in people in general. So she's actively trying to confound this algorithm, this um, idea of trend makers, you know, uh, on Instagram and with her Ravelry group and her podcast and her zine, she wants to go against the tendency to submit to that hierarchy. So she is uh, investing time in undoing it. Um, she's not pretending all ideas come with her uh, crediting other people even if they don't have a lot of followers. Um, she said even with permission to mention someone or to use someone's idea, it would be great to cite who they are. Be super citational, she said. We could create a shift and we would be being true to ourselves if we did this. Not pretending, you know, that we are the source of all these ideas and thoughts. So she says to go find your community, follow and like people even when they don't have many followers, talk to them, cite them, um, be kind and don't steal. Again, I don't really know what has been happening that she's seeing, but we see this all the time in the world. Uh, somebody <laughs> buys something, thinks, huh, I could do this. They simply repackage the same thing and they're selling it, maybe at a better price. As Etsy is so frustrating, I know, for people who sell on their handmade goods for that reason. So uh, are we doing that with thoughts and with ideas? I have had conversations with people where I just think, hey, we're talking. They're telling me about them. I'm telling them about me. And the next time I see them, they're saying like word for word, long portions of what I said as though it were about them. They really can't remember hearing that from me. It doesn't even fit them. It's, it's strange. Um, it's not an insult. Some people say imitation is the greatest form of flattery. It's not insulting. It's just thoughts or ideas or personality quirks or, I don't know, jokes or whatever. But isn't it strange when a person hears these things about you and they only remember the words you say to use personally and they don't remember you connected with it at all? I find that sad because you're this human being they're not even acknowledging. I never want to be that way in my creative life with other people. If I am influenced even slightly by someone, I love the idea of like a radical honesty where I say exactly what the influence was and oh, do you remember such and such? For instance, no, oh, I don't have it by me. One of those Knit One magazines um, that I had from way back, there's a, a sweater in there, it's funky. I don't want to make that sweater. I just am inspired by it to do something similar with a different kind of yarn. And if I ever did that, I would totally be citing that sweater as the inspiration or something I'd see on the streets. Um, it's very pretentious and there's a lot of pretension. And the whole talk about representation and the algorithm, pretension goes in there with it all too. So um, it was just interesting to see as I thought about where does imitation cross the line into creative theft to read this zine that I'd gotten from Mimi and see her talking about, hey, let's, let's be revolutionary. Let's befriend lots of people. Let's 
Cite our sources, even if they're not well known. They don't have to be part of the who's who to get some credit or a little, I don't know, a little moment. I like that idea. Um, and following lots of different people. I, I recommend that anyway. I have a hard time not following people that follow me. And my Instagram is out of control now. I can't, I can't find anybody on it <laughs> because I'm following so many people. I'm missing out on everybody basically, but it's really hard not to. Um, I know this, that I, I like looking at the things right. I just like people, real people being real. That's all I know. So, uh, so why do we do that? Why do we pretend um, all things, ideas came from us? Is it our pride? Is it for some little sad credit that has to do with fashion or style? Is it for money? I know in some cases it's absolutely money. Hey, this person's making money doing this. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to borrow all their info and I'm going to regurgitate it and make money selling it cheaper. That's kind of what we've seen on Etsy. However, we also have to keep in mind that, you know, there's this cultural phenomenon where we all kind of come to the same realizations and ideas around the same time. Maybe it's driven by certain influences that we can't even pick up on because we see so many images around us. But certain styles, they kind of all are ripe at the same time. And, and so it's just natural that a lot of designers are going to be doing some of the same things at the same time. I read this article by Jenna Martin on the Jenna Martin photo blog and it's called, Are We All can we all just stop complaining about stolen ideas already? And she's a photographer who was dabbling in heavily edited Photoshop type dreamlike photographs. And she had this image she was particularly proud of. And it's a woman like standing, holding the edge of her dress, you know, like in a field or something. And the dress is made of rose petals. It's not actually a dress. And uh, she was very proud of it. And one day someone commented on her website or something and said, oh, that reminds me of so-and-so's photo. Well, she goes and looks at their photo and it's the exact same thing almost, a similar background even. Woman standing almost the same position exactly and instead of red petals, it's red butterflies. She's like, they took my idea. But she looks and the date, that, that person's photograph was out before hers, a year or so before hers. So. Did she inadvertently steal someone's idea? Did she see it somewhere? Was she somehow exposed to this? No. And so, you know, she started to realize how few ideas there really are. And we all can kind of come up with the same ideas around the same time. It happened with many other photos. Uh, in fact, she would just do a search like person floating playing piano and get like a hundred people who did something just like hers, uh, her photograph. So um, she goes to an art festival or something where judges are, are grading uh, photographs and um, it's like a contest. And several of the judges as they pass her work ask, oh, so you didn't go to art school, did you? And she said, no. And finally, after a few have said this, one of them says it and she says, what difference does it make if I went to art school or not? if I can produce this. And they said, well, it's just that when you go to school, you learn about the body of work that came before you. And so what you're doing is being unintentionally derivative. That was a real blow to her. But the judge said, don't worry about it. Keep at it. Eventually you'll get all this stuff out of your system and then the good stuff comes. And so she can say at this point in her life that yes, that's absolutely true. So, um, I don't know. I just thought that was a neat way to put it. So her thoughts on copying someone, this is what she said. Copying someone else, douche move. Copying their concept, douche move. Being so arrogant as to think everything you've created is the original and then attacking others is also a douche move. Um, she said one idea, well, the point is it can happen that people can all come up with the same idea, especially when the tech for Photoshop and all that 
things are shifting and coming out at the same time, it's inevitable that people are going to have similar ideas. But you know in your heart when it's not really yours. Or you could just give someone a little nod. Um, so I thought about it and, uh, you know, Jenna Martin also said she had an idea for a book interviewing photographers of that photo they never got that they wish they had and a few years after she had tossed that idea around in her head and planned to do it she saw someone came up with exactly that book and she was disappointed but obviously he couldn't have stopped her and heard the two conversations she might have said with somebody uh, in private about it it's just a good idea and someone else came up with it and she said it doesn't mean that my skills or my idea is any less good just because they did it first. But she had a choice of how she could view it and she decided to just buy his book and enjoy it. And I, I thought that was kind of cool, the way she did it. So uh, my ideas are your ideas on imitation in say knitwear designs to be specific or crochet designs. When is it original? You know, say the traditional yoke that so many people are doing, it's really just a matter of picking the colors and the design and the number of contrast colors. Because the top-down yoke thing, once you decide how wide you, your necklines, neckline is going to be, you could basically use Elizabeth Zimmerman's recipe and come up with a hundred patterns. Is that original? Elizabeth's recipe has been out forever. Um, so many of the designs you see out today, they're very similar except what the pattern of the yoke is. Uh, they've got a template already ready to go and they're just dropping in colorful yokes. And is it derivative? Um, I wonder what you guys think. When does an idea go from being an inspiration from someone else to creative theft? Uh, I, a while back when I used to be really active, doing in photo groups on Flickr, a friend named Beth, she said she took a photo that was inspired by another professional photographer. She's just, she was an amateur, I think, at the time. And she said, she quoted someone saying, if you change at least three things about an idea that inspires you, you can usually make it your own. Three significant things changed. I liked that thought. I thought it was interesting and I think that I was inspired by one of her photos to take one and I changed three things about it, I think. But that idea has always stuck with me. It's not that that's the magic number and oh, if I can just think of three things to change then I can call it my own. It's just, are you making a significant change? Uh, it's worth thinking about. So I wondered where you guys stood on that. Um, and then as far as social media and using it to gather ideas, to mine for ideas, but not citing where you're getting them, it seems kind of crummy to me. Um, the whole point of social media is that it's a community. Um, the word social or society, it means a group of people living together in the same place with shared ownership. So. It's not very social if we're being antisocial and taking, you know, ideas from others and not giving them credit or thanking them for the inspiration. I, I like, I like giving people credit, but at the same time, I would not pretend that we can't all, a lot of us, come up with <clears throat> similar ideas at the same time. So I practice that radical honesty. I've just been that way for a long time. Um, I usually will cite where I heard a joke, where I saw something, especially if it's ideas, because I love conversation and ideas are important to me. And so if I hear an idea, I'm going to tell you where I heard it from, almost always, uh, unless I'm short on time or something. Sometimes there's people who have no patience for long sentences <laughs> and I just make it brief if I think it's important to tell them something. I also like enjoying people and recognizing them. So in the end, um, when it comes to if we've borrowed ideas from other people, no one may know, but you know. And so what Mimi said about being true to yourself, it's kind of a different way of looking at being true to yourself. 
think, when have you heard people use that phrase? You've got to be true to yourself. Isn't it almost always a positive usage of it? Like, I will gain something. I will be true. I will be free to do what I want and not feel hampered by someone else. Um, it just has really positive connotations usually, but part of being true to yourself is admitting where you end and another person begins. And uh, that's saying, oh, I, yeah, thank you so much for that idea. That's so smart. That is what I'm going to do next time. Something like that. And it's very community building. It's really a smart way to com connect with other people, I think. Tell me what you think. When is inspiration? How do you keep an inspiration from becoming a uh, creative theft? Last week I asked you if there were any old pattern books or patterns that you've always been meaning to knit but you've never gotten around to, like me and my mini Rowan books, um, Martin Story patterns. Um, I will tell you, I picked a Martin Story. I'll show it to you in a minute. Um, so Jen said she has lots of knit picks pattern books like you get a 40% off sale, you know, but she's ashamed to say she hasn't knit from any of them. I'm right there with you, Jen. I have a lot of pattern books that that's the case. And I don't ever buy a pattern book for one pattern. I buy it because I like them all, even if I know I won't get to them right away. If I like the photography especially, yeah, I'll get the book. So Brooke has lots of pattern books. Um, she mentioned Alana Dekos, uh, Jane Richmond, she mentioned um, some Vera Valmaki ebooks, yeah, the Matter Anthology, and Stephanie Jappel, and she said Juju's Loops, which I've never actually seen, and there's a, a, a cardigan in there called Cinnamon Girl. I love, I, but see, I wouldn't get the book because it's the only thing I really want, I would knit probably out of it. And of course, I wouldn't get to it for years. Um, she also has the weekend knitting book and uh, has been meaning to make the brioche hat for, uh, I think she said for her husband. I've been meaning to make that too. I've been meaning to make everything in it. I've only made a few things out of it. Oh, what did she say? Oh no, Loop de Loop by Tava Durham was another one that she really liked. She remembered loving it, but if she went back and saw it now, it might be kind of dated. She might not want to knit these things. It is a different kind of book. Like, it's not just classic designs. Oh, look at these. Look at these knits on the back. Light chevron sweater is awesome. It's not just classic designs. Some of this is really unique. Um, look, I have, um, I have, I still have pieces of paper where I wanted to make this, like, um, this ballet shirt, well, let's see if I can show you, this ballet shirt, um, I really wanted to make that. Now that looks so uncomfortable to me. I think I would be so hot and sweaty in it and have big sweat rings. I have to make it black yarn to not show my sweat rings. But I was unrealistic when I was a beginning knitter and I didn't know how I would actually feel in some of these items. Um, Oh, there was a um, lacy leaf pullover was one. I think it's on the cover. Yeah. Now this model is wearing a super oversized version. Not super, but it is not the size that they would recommend. You know how now we have our E's built into the patterns? Like it says, for a, a, a 36 bust, you will end up with a 46 you know, bust on your finished item. These don't do that. So she's not knitting. They didn't knit this woman's bust size for her, but I love it oversized. I think it's really cute. Oh, there's a carpet bag. Oh, and this is something that if I ever did, I would totally be borrowing from this. They don't quite look like paisleys here. Can you see this little paisley bag? I loved this bag, though, when this came out. And I started making little paisleys. But it was really tedious, and I got distracted, and I didn't ever finish. Um, I thought often about this and thought, wouldn't it be cool to make a uh, basket liner for my bike in those little paisleys? 
So yes, I do have this book and I do remember it, Brooke. The Spare Isle. Bias Fair Isle. Um, that's a really great uh, sweater. So, yeah, I have it. Loop to loop. I started the carpet bag. It's the only thing I started out of it. Didn't finish it. Julie said that she has lots of old pattern books and uh, she mentioned some like she had weekend knitting and she felt the same way as I did like oh this is just the most beautiful peaceful calm photographs and oh this is what knitting should be and um, she felt the same way about it just transported by these images but she mentioned another one that she loved and that I also have and that and this is so this is such a good book have you seen knit two together it's Tracy Ullman, you remember, the actress and singer, and Mel Clark. And they actually have a pattern for this sweater that you wear with somebody else. Um, all of these are really fun patterns, and the book has a sense of humor to it. Um, when I actually thought of this book before I read Julie's comment, I don't think she had had her comment written then when I was looking at that uh, Knit One magazine with my husband. You see that in the end of the last episode. They had a pair of pants and I was like, oh, I'd like to see what these look like. And I looked them up on Ravelry off to the side and they didn't fit terrible. And it made me think of this book because there were two pair of pants in here and you just didn't see knitted pants way back when. But first, look at the skirt. It's a linen skirt. I think it's called the linen kilts. Linen kilt, yeah. And uh, I still want that. I still would make that. Um, the simple bath mat. That's easy. I got the cotton. I could do that right now. These little slippers, very cute. Little felted slippers. There's a really cute dress here. They call it gem slip dress. It's got a panel of uh, lace. It's kind of hard to see, it's dark. So um, those were some of the things I really liked in here, but my favorite, there was a, a shrug I really liked and uh, this sweater. I liked this sweater so much. Still want to do it. It's called the Butterfly Pullover and it just has intarsia flowers on it. Kind of like you might see um, like you might see uh, embroider, embroidery on a vintage sweater. I love that sweater. And there was a lacy hug me tight. I also liked that. But here were the pants. They had two pairs of pants. They had sailor pants, which has a very uh, yoga pants, kind of gym pants feel to it. And then something called witches britches. Someone knit them in stripes on Ravelry, and it's so cute. And they're just little, little capris with lace flared lace edging on the bottom. Yeah, it's a cute book. It's a lot of fun. Yes, Julie, I have seen Knit Two Together. I love it. So Julie's like getting excited thinking, you know, there's all this good stuff that I have. I just really need to do some of this, but she never knit any of it because she felt like it was just too difficult for her, which is very similar to how I told you guys that I felt about uh, a lot of those, even stuff in knit one, you know, I'm definitely going to be knitting some things out of older books. If I don't, it'll be because I'm trying to make stuff up that I, makes me nostalgic for those kind of knits, which I'll have to be following my own rule about, wait, I'm not borrowing an idea from somebody else. That's a pattern that's already out. It will have to be originally mine even if it's inspired by a look or something from the past. I'm gonna let my dog in. She lets herself out, she can't get back in. Now they're both barking. Actually, just Spot is barking. 
Spot is gross. I found him eating a squirrel in the backyard the other day, and I know he did not catch and kill a squirrel. So I'm thinking he surprised a cat in the backyard and they left their kill, or else a hawk flying overhead dropped it. But it was so gross. It was totally drained of blood. Um, yeah. I just don't look at him the same. <laughs> since then and I like washed his mouth out and I washed his paws and I mean it was a bloodless affair but it was nasty. I know he's just a dog. Speaking of older patterns, I decided on what I wanted it for that Martin Story knit along and I don't know if I'll get it finished in time because like I said I want to do a sport weight version of the sweater I made up but here's what it is that I want to knit. This is from Rowan 63, which was like, I don't know what year that came out. It doesn't say. I don't think it was very long ago. There's some really good uh, wraps. And they have a lot of cotton sweaters in here with like Rowan cotton or wool cotton. It's a textured sweater and it's done with like wool cotton, some kind of Rowan cotton. I'm not going to was it showing? Yeah. I'm not going to use cotton. I just don't think I would enjoy it. I could try using like Kotlin from Knit Picks, but I don't think I would enjoy it. I don't think I would wear it. I think that I need wool cotton or wool for winter and then I just need to make summer knits that are more open weave like the things I showed you in the last episode, water clover or something like that instead of uh, like long sleeves. So what I would use for this is, I've had some um, Will of the Andes tweed sport in pompous, this colorway. And you see in this, they have, I like the way they did the color grade. Like the upper part is a lighter shade of blue than the slightly darker shade. And there's like a straw color used throughout the entire thing. So what I thought I would do is use the pompous, pampas, pompous, I don't know how to say it. And this is time, I believe. And the two of them together, uh, looks kind of dark. And this would be the contrast, a burgundy color. So not showing too well. It's kind of dark in here. I don't know what the deal is. But anyway, um, I think it'll be an interesting little sweater to knit. And so I've already started, but I just have my cast on row. <laughs> it's not worth showing you. Um, and so that's with the Fruity Knitting group, which I finally became a patron of Fruity Knitting. I haven't done Patreon with anybody before, but I watched their shows and they really are super informative. And I thought, you know, I watch this every time and uh, I appreciate what they do. So it's not a lot. It's just a small amount to do but and then there's benefits if you're a patron so um i think martin story's patterns were on sale to patrons um they usually have yarn dyers or uh, companies that have discounts uh, designers things like that so uh so i'm doing my plaid sweater the sport weight version i'm doing martin story i've got to finish my floozy i have a guthrie i haven't even hardly gotten underway. Um, there's a lot to think about here. Uh, so I guess that's all I'm going to talk with you guys about because otherwise I'm, um, yeah, I'm going to go on too long. I'm already going to have to cut stuff out and fix it. So, all right. I hope you have a good week. Oh, did you like my Gigi Made It shirt? I got that this week. Uh, Gigi is somebody I didn't know. Uh, well, actually, she was on a Christy Glass episode, but I haven't watched a lot of the uh, like older Christy Glass uh, Knits podcast episodes, so I didn't know. But she was in her This Is Us uh, discussion that she had with so many different uh, just knitters on her show about representation and racism and uh so i liked what Gigi had to say and then 
I followed her on Instagram and a lot of people found out about her from Instagram too. So she was never in my radar on Instagram. The algorithm never showed me her, but and I, I followed knitters of Instagram. I followed instant it, you know, those hashtags. I never saw her, but, uh, now I do a lot. Anyway, I like her. This is her logo and it's just so cute. This is just too cool. This is a great design, a great logo design. Um, uh, so tell me what you think about uh, how to take an inspiration and make it your own without borrowing too heavily on someone else. Maybe in design or maybe in something else. Um, or what do you think about the idea of changing three fundamental things about something and that makes it your own? It's no longer another person's idea. I'm just curious what you guys think about creative uh, inspiration, theft, all of that. Um, so you've seen, uh, there's two ways of thinking about it. Uh, really, in the end, we just monitor ourselves, I guess. But I want to hear what your thoughts are. Um, thank you all for watching. Have a great week. I'm going to go watch Teen Wolf and probably have chocolate cake again with the right attitude. Bye. <laughs>